tracking my cookies. So what, what are you looking for? And is the information you get useful, and what is it? Right. Um, Just pull the mic up a little closer. Sure. Uh, passing, passing passive tracking technologies can be utilized in different ways. A couple of the ones that I cited in my written testimony is one, ad exposure. Uh, the fact that you were exposed to a certain ad. Um, can you tell that from a cookie that I was exposed to an ad? Yes, you can tell which ad. So when I get an ad on Drudge for a car or for a book, that's based upon my previous search engines on Drudge or Google. And so you get from those cookies, you read those cookies and say, okay, Stearns went to Amazon.com. He went to these sites and these sites. You find that all out. Right. Well, it wouldn't be as far as uh, going to search, or there, there might be some categories where you might not have availability to track or know what the consumer engagement was. But there are, um, on, on a larger scale, there is the practice of tracking exposure to advertising so that you're not burdened with um, excessive advertising of the same kind. And then you sell this to the ad advertisers to tell them this is how effective you were or not. Right. So the idea is to uh, understand how they performed, whether it were being relevant yeah. or not, similar to we, how we would do with TV or any yeah. other forum. As a customer, do you make the customers aware of this? In other words, let's say you're doing this on me. How would I find out that you're doing it and what you're doing? Sure. Um, you, one thing we've been actively uh, encouraging and working on is proactive privacy. Uh, the privacy icon project that we were involved in is about allowing for uh, a enhanced notice to consumers that then gives them disclosure. But you're not now doing it. It's a self-regulatory initiative that's underway. Uh -huh. We are definitely doing uh, the, the best standards or best practices of informing about our practices within privacy policies and wherever else we can. But we are encouraging that the industry absorb an enhanced notice self under a self-regulatory framework that allows for disclosure that may be more relevant to them that we are being told is important for consumers. So yes. we're trying to respond in a way that allows for consumers to have transparency, but yeah. then allows for business to have work in the way that it traditionally has, to be effective in their communications. Um, you know, we tried to pass a spyware bill here in the... Uh, Energy and Commerce. We just couldn't get the Senate to agree. And within that spyware, there was a uh, study that Mr. Dingle put in to look at cookies and the impact. Do you think uh, the privacy bill should have anything applicable to cookies that come into the computer? I think that uh, regulating technology is a tricky thing, as That's we've what already I mean. heard. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think technology is uh, necessarily the enemy. I think we can talk about the uses of it. I think we can talk about how we disclose how we're using it. We can talk about how we give over the levers of control about how we can use it. You said uh, you discussed a technology you developed in 2007, uh, one of your subs subsidiaries, SafeCount? Yes, yes, sir. That uh, allows users to see not only what tracking cookies are on their computer, but what data they're collecting, but also where their tracking cookies came from. So is that in practice, that SafeCount? Is that being used? That's right. Uh, consumers can have insight into uh, what cookies there are on their browser from SafeCount and also which ad it was spawned from. Is this SafeCount program given to other com other companies besides WPP? Uh, uh, it certainly could be. It's a what I said in my written statement is that we we've seen other larger actors now going in that direction. Uh, it was in support of my, the, the idea that self-regulation can work. We've seen other actors going towards providing access to the interests that, and profiles that they build online and le letting consumers have some control over whether those interests are built and what those interest groups they would want to belong to or not. Do you think uh, we should uh, prevent spyware? I I'm sorry, sir, I didn't get the last part. Do you think we should prevent spyware in Congress? I think spyware by, again, it would matter what, we define a spyware, but spyware, if it means something that consumers did not transparently get notice of and consent to, and it engages in activity that they would not want, yes, I think it should be okay. prohibited. Ms. Barrett, um, Mr. Doyle talked to you about he had a series of questions, and he said, uh, will you tell me this information? And you said, we will not tell you information about risk product. Is that correct? 
We will tell you, we will show you exactly what we have in our risk and identity management products, yes. But he said, if, can I get all of it? And you said no, I thought. Uh, in the mar for the marketing products, we yeah. offer a summary of the information, not uh, the details. And, and some of the information you won't provide, and why would that be? Because it's proprietary information that you've developed that you have a pri proprietary interest in? Is that perhaps why? No, it's the fact that the information uh, is, is not commonly requested at an individual level, and so we've not put the systems in place to go retrieve it and look at it on one person. Marketing applications look at the data in thousands or tens of thousands or millions of, of records at a time. He uh, it also asked a question about uh, uh, regulate online collection use of data should, should be clear about the extent of the harm we're seeking to address. Uh, do you believe that harm exists uh, in online data collection or is it a risk of harm? Um, I think that there is the potential for harm in almost any data collection, I think it speaks to how do we use information and where uh, can we define risk under, in certain uses and then how, how can we develop guidelines that either prevent or mitigate against that risk relative to that use. And, it, and for example, I might point out uh, the, some of the self-regulatory guidelines that have been put in place, for instance, for marketing by the uh, Direct Marketing Association and the Internet Advertising Bureau, uh, in the Network Advertisers Initiative. Those are three different groups that have defined different kinds of guidelines uh, relative to uh, different marketing activities. This is the last question, Mr. Chairman, and this is more tough. You know, here we are trying to legislate a privacy bill. What harm should this privacy bill address then? I mean, can you say that concisely? Well, I think that's the challenge, is defining exactly what are the harms that we yeah. think consumers are at risk of. Yeah. Um, uh, my panelist down here, Ms. Dixon, mentioned some of the things uh, in terms of denying consumers substantive benefits, and I think that might be an area to explore. It's certainly not an area that we see in the marketing arena, but uh, information that's used outside of uh, simply trying to reach you with a relevant uh, communication uh, well might present some uh, some harms to consumers, and, and those should be explored. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Stearns. The chair now recognizes Mr. Inslee. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Huffnagel. I was looking at a document attached, I think, to your testimony from the Venti Company, which shows lists of, is this your information? It is. Yeah, so it shows this company, it appears that they sell lists of people who have certain conditions, so cancer prostate, it shows they have 125,400 names of people who have cancer of the prostate. Do, they, is that, do I read this right? This company will tell you who has cancer of the prostate? I, I think you're uh, referring to two different portions of my uh, uh, appendix here. Uh, one is the ailments, diseases, and illness sufferers mailing list, which is sold uh, by a company that is a member of the Direct Marketing Association. Venti, the Venti list is the addiction responders um, uh, list, and it advertises who is struggling with an addiction to gambling, sex, or food, who just can't say no to drugs, alcohol, or tobacco, millions of Americans, um, and Venti has them. So Venti has the names of people who have had an alcohol problem then, and they sell those names, is that right? That is what their advertising claims. And um, typically, uh, where do they get the information that a person has had an alcohol problem? The sources are likely to be self-reported. Um, so, for instance, if a consumer fills out a survey and checks a box saying that I have struggled with alcoholism, that is information that could be bundled and resold in this type of context. context. It would not come, for instance, from a health care provider. So this would be, uh, it could be a, a product loyalty card um, uh, that associated, is associated with purchases or self-reported data. So let me ask you about the, the other document. It talk, let's talk about cancer of the prostate. Th this other document suggests that there's a database of people suffering for a wide variety of ailments, diseases, illnesses, and medical conditions, including cancer of the prostate. There's 125,400 names, as I understand that. Does this group sell names of people with that condition? This information is personally identifiable. So it's name and address. And then if you look along the right-hand side of the first page, 
there are what are known as selects, which means that for extra money, you can buy their age, ethnicity, sex, whether they're a homeowner, et cetera. And where typically would, would this company have received the information, the personally identifiable information that people have cancer of the prostate? With respect to this list, its provenance is claimed to be a lifestyle questionnaire. So um, an example would be you're walking through the mall and someone stops you and says, well, you fill out this survey and we'll give you a gift card or we'll give you some, something free. If you fill out that survey, it could end up in a database like this, and there is no right to notice. They don't have to give you notice that they're selling the data. Uh, they don't have to give you access, et cetera. So they don't have to tell you that it could be used by someone who's got a grudge against you and wants to publicly divulge that information to embarrass you then? That is really unlikely in this context. Because? That this information is sold in bulk. It, if you look at the terms, it says $150 slash M, which means that it's a thousand names for $150. You could not say uh, to these companies, I would like um, to know uh, whether Chris Hoofnagel was in the cancel. Well, why not? Why couldn't somebody say, give me $10,000 and tell me all you got on uh, Mike Doyle? Why couldn't they, could they legally do that? It wouldn't be worth that much money. <laughs> These companies are not set up to, at least this type of company is not architected to sell information about a specific in individual. Now, with respect to the pizza delivery exhibit that I, I, um, I provided, where uh, Merlin Data is selling identifiable information about people's homes, their unlisted phone numbers, their cell phone numbers, et cetera, um, th that is very different. That's when you say, this is a situation where you say, I want information about a specific individual. Do you have it? Thank you. Um I believe, Ms. Barrett, uh, you're with Axiom. Do I have? Yes, I'm sorry. So you, you show a document. I'm looking at the health buying activity, and they show various codes I'm looking at. Code 6437 is for health female wellness. Um, code 6436 is health diet slash weight loss. What would be the information to generate people's inclusion in those codes? Where would you generate that information? It would come from self-reported or, or survey information where the consumer is, has indicated that they uh, have an interest in information about that topic. And for the surveys that we use, we require that there be a notice that the information will be used for marketing purposes by other parties and give the consumer the chance to opt out of that or to come directly to us and say, I don't want you to use that information. So if a, if a person visited a website selling a weight loss product, could their visit to the website, to their opening that page, end up being coded on this in some fashion? I uh, don't believe so. And what leads to a little question about that in your mind? Well, I'm, I'm not, I would have to go back and look at all the individual sources that contribute to that. So is there any legal, do, let me ask the panel in general, is there any legal prohibition at the moment if a person visits a weight loss website that, that provides weight loss services or products? Let's say a person just visits the website, opens the page. Is there any legal prohibition of that owner of that page disseminating to a data information service the fact that this computer, this identity identified computer, has visited that site, and then that data collector being able to collect, if they have some connection to an individual, connecting that to the data. Is there any legal prohibition on that happening right now? There is. There's no legal prohibition, but industry code of conduct, as well as the Direct Marketing Association uh, code, calls for the, the disclosure of that practice to the consumer, and at least in a privacy policy, if not more boldly uh, on the page, and then the chance for the consumer to opt out of that disclosure to another party. Ms. Dixon, did you? Thank you. It's a good question. There's no legal requirement for that to happen. And one of the more troubling issues with websites uh, is that they're very compelling. You can take, for example, Facebook surveys, where especially uh, children, teens, and young adults will just go in, and they're very uh, inured to giving out certain information, such as about anorexia and other you know, topics they talk about online now. They'll give the information out, and these notices can be quite small, and they don't see them. 
and then their information gets sold. So it's not just that you visited a weight loss uh, website. It's that you visited the site, then you filled out your name and, and perhaps gave, gave them your email, and then that can be further associated down, downstream and used in collaboration and linked with other data. But in some cases, the information is so identifiable, it doesn't even need to be linked. When you look at these uh, really scary lists of ailments, you know, the prostate cancer, the mental health lists, these people are, are known by name because they've freely given their name. And one of the really difficult questions I think that this committee faces is that the opt-in, opt-out model is very challenging because it's so challenging to educate consumers about, well, what does giving your name on such a website actually mean to you? Are you opting in? Do you really know what you're opting into? Because, for example, the mental health list, those people uh, gave that information up in some way, uh, typically through some kind of website or survey or sweepstakes. And did they really, truly know and comprehend the full consequences of their actions? It's a tough question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Inslee. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Rush. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just have two questions. I know that the time is is uh, quickly uh, passing by, and I want to just have two questions for the panel. I'll, no, no, I well, on second thought, I'll just ask Professor Hofnegger uh, about this. Uh, these two questions. Uh, Professor Hoffnagel, we don't need to look at uh, any further than Axiom's Native Products Catalog or the Next, Next Mark website referenced in uh, your testimony to see that companies are collecting and selling personal information about individuals that many Americans consider sensitive, such as their race, ethnicity, religious affiliation, and political affiliation, not to mention information on a wide range of sensitive health topics and medical conditions, including addiction, sexual dysfunction, bowel disorders, body odor, obesity, infertility, uh, and many pause, menopause. And this list can go on and on and on um, uh, regarding the sensitive information. Are any topics off limits for commercial use, or is it is the general rule that if information exists, collect and sell it, and sell it? The next question is: If we can agree that some categories of data should be off limits, or require heightened levels of consumer consent. How do we define that category of sensitive data? Mr. Chairman, those are two very good questions. If I could address the second one first. Um, I have tried to move away from the opt-in, opt-out question because framing rights in that way can easily be manipulated. It is easy to trick people into opting in. And conversely, it is easy to um, make it so people will not opt out. So I have suggested several other interventions. One is having the data disappear after a certain amount of time. So if you have a, an upward data retention limit is one way of doing it. But there are other tools from the advertising world that can be used. One example is, advertising, uh, is advertiser liability. So for instance, in the telemarketing, spam, and junk fax laws, um, advertisers can be liable if they hire spammers who, um, excuse me, advertisers can be liable if they send out, if they hire someone to send out email that violates the can spam uh, uh, law. In this context, you could create liability for people who buy certain lists and abuse them. Um, an example out of Iowa is worth noting. Uh, there was a list brokerage company there that was selling a list known as elderly impulsives and they were using it to take advantage of senior citizens who had problems remembering, um, and as a result, were able to architect a scam around that. The data seller, uh, I think, should offer some due diligence, especially when they are, are um, using sensitive personal information. 
uh, and that can be in reviewing the advertising that's ultimately disseminated or in being responsible if, if the advertiser ultimately uses the information to take advantage of people. Um, the, you know, with respect to your first question, the, the general legal standard in the U.S. is that offline data collection is not regulated by a specific federal privacy law, except in certain areas. Your video rental records, for instance, are protected. Your cable records are protected. But between the, uh, in, in all the gaps left by these sectoral laws, there's a data collection even on sensitive personal information. You may. Thank you. Well, seeing no, no more members uh, here, we want to thank uh, all of our witnesses for their testimony today, uh, and this hearing is adjourned. Mike.